Hello, agentpreneurs, and welcome to today's episode of the Daily List Report. As always, I'm super excited about my guest, and today is no different. We have Jess Lunavelle. She's with the Listings Lab. She's actually coming to us all the way from Toronto today. About half of her business is up there, about half of her business in the States. She's been in real estate for over 14 years, personally built multiple seven-figure businesses, and she really focuses on helping people get to that next level. And I don't want to spoil anything. We're going to talk to her all about that. While we're here, a couple things to point out. No surprise, she's super active on social media. She's got a ton of followers on Instagram. Check her out there, Jess Linovell. Uh, we'll post the link below so you don't have to remember that. You can click on it. Also, super active on Facebook. And so I'm showing you right now the listing lab method for real estate agents on Facebook. Again, the link will be below. Uh, you're going to fill out a little form so that they can make sure that this group stays filled with the right kind of people, which I think is a great best practice. Um, and then I'm going to post to another article that gives a little bit of backstory. Um, here's an article from entrepreneur.com, how I escaped domestic violence, built a seven-figure empire, and found love along the way. So if that isn't a compelling headline, I don't know what is. So without further ado, let's bring Jess on. Jess, welcome to the Daily List Report. Thank you so much. I am thrilled to be here. Super excited to have you. See, I was so excited to have you on that I didn't even remind people to subscribe. Talk about failing best practices. <laughs> I, I, I get people in my company and they come to me, they're like, they're like, how come you just say subscribe? How come you don't say like smash the button, right? Things like that. So, you know, smash the subscribe button and click the little bell. So anyways, if you like this, definitely do that and make sure you follow Jess on her channels as well. Um, Okay, so Jess, really excited to hear your story. I read your back, I read your articles. Um, I love to give my guests the opportunity to spend a couple minutes and introduce themselves. Personally, I love people's stories and their journeys more than anything. Whenever I interview a candidate for the company, where I start is I say, I wanna know your story. Where did yeah. you start? And you don't have to start from birth. You can pick your starting point, right? Mm -hmm. But I wanna hear what your journey looked like and how it got you to where you are today. For sure. Um, so I kind of grew up in the industry. Mom's been a realtor for 35 years. So, you know, growing up, I was the kid in the backseat of the car, yeah. you know, showings, running around, playing with her map book back in the day. Oh, yeah. Um, I <laughs> so that was kind of the origin. Um, I went to University of Toronto, came out of there with a degree in African and Caribbean studies. So not a whole lot that I really practically could do with that. And so I really didn't know what I wanted to do. And so my mom said, why don't you get into real estate? I was 21. I was really young. Why don't you get into real estate and try it out? See what you think. Um, I got in, did my first couple deals and thought, oh, I can make a lot of money doing this. Yeah. <laughs> and so it kind of stuck. I really loved the business. Um, so I was an active agent for 14 or 15 years. Um, and then, you know, built, I, I, I've kind of learned the business from every angle, worked for builders, did resale uh, for a period of time. I actually specialized in like resort properties. So I've done a lot of different things and what really kind of changed the game for me was really stopping looking at myself as a realtor and starting to look at myself as a marketer. Yeah. And once I actually learned the marketing and kind of took on that identity, it made a really big difference in terms of what what happened with my own business. Um, a lot of the time when we get into real estate, people don't explain to us that like, you really have two jobs in this industry. And, and um, there was nobody out there that was really teaching marketing the way that I wanted to do it. You know, I started at Keller Williams, it was a lot of cold calling and door knocking and things like that. And I'm, I, I identify as an introvert. So mm -hmm. that the idea of me having to like go and like knock on people's doors, like felt like death. Mm -hmm. So I started kind of doing it my own way. I, uh, Facebook was this brand new thing that yeah. no one was really using for business at the time. And so what I did is I started going on to the classified section and there was no mark. And that's really how I built my business. And all, like, I still have clients re reaching out to me that will say, hey, like, I know you don't sell anymore, but can you give me a referral to somebody who can help me from back then? Um, so that's how I started. I started that way. My business kind of built from there. And then we I grew a couple of teams. I did it the wrong way. 
the first time. Um, I built a team that was very highly reliant on me. Mm -hmm. And then I built another team that wasn't. And the way that we kind of went about the marketing, it's obviously we've updated it and adjusted it, but it's really the same idea. The, the basic idea is that you're creating relationships at scale. It's not yeah. just lead generation. I really believe that anybody can generate leads. It's not hard. Yeah. But generating a client is very different. I couldn't I couldn't agree more, right? There's there's lots of places to generate leads, but mm -hmm. that's the leaky funnel that we refer to here at List Reports, right? You can get them, you can throw them in the top, but how you nurture them and get them to a point where they become a client, that's yeah. actually the hardest part. Totally. Um, you said something interesting, Jess, I just want to touch on, right? So um, we affectionately call all of our agent users out there agentpreneurs, right? We, mm -hmm. we are entrepreneurs ourselves. And you mm -hmm. mentioned something which is, oh my gosh, I also have to be good at marketing. And in your case, some of the aspects of that sort of scared you to death, which is totally understandable. Mm -hmm. But we call our agents agentpreneurs because like an entrepreneur, you kind of have to be good at a lot of things. And totally. it's, a, it's what makes the job hard. It's like, I have to be a negotiator and a finance person and a marketer and a salesperson and customer service. Like, like you sort of are a business all rolled into one. How do yep. you think about that aspect of the job? I think that it's something that is, I think it makes us stronger, <laughs> if anything. Yeah. Um, I'm a really big proponent that you have to learn every part of the business before you outsource. Mm -hmm. um, so I love that you that you think about, about it that way as well. Um, I'm, I think that there's a lot of people in real estate who all they want to do is focus on the thing that they like, which is the client, but like the face to face client stuff. And I get it. But a lot of the time, what ends up happening is they start outsourcing things way too early. And it's not either not done well, or, you know, they don't have a deep understanding of it. So they don't even know if it's being done properly or not. It happens so, all the time. Yeah. And then really what ends up happening is your business becomes very vulnerable in yeah. a couple of different places, because if you don't understand it, how can you determine whether or not someone else is doing a good job? So when, so just when you look back, right, when you, when you sort of rewind the clock a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. you're selling homes, you're doing well, you're making money, you know, talk about that first transition to building a team. What did that mm -hmm. look like? What mistakes did you make along the way? Um, I waited too long. Mm. So I would say that was my biggest mistake is that I waited too long. I waited to, the point where my phone would ring and I would cry. Hmm. Or I, I remember one time handing the phone to my husband and saying, you answer it. Right. 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 And he's like, I don't know what to say. <laughs> and I was like, I don't care what you say. You should, you answer it. Yeah. And, and I think that there's this element of um, no one else can do it as well as I can, yes. which is always going to be true to a certain extent, but it also is a very limiting mindset because you then become the bottleneck in your in your business. And I became a really great marketer and we had great marketing and things were rolling in and is I waited too long and I kind of started to scale up. And I think that being able to scale intentionally and know what you're doing and why is on me and that, you know, I, I was babysitting and managing and things like that. And the reason behind it was because I didn't have operating procedures in place. I didn't have direct roles and responsibilities in place. I wasn't hiring the best of the best because I was desperate. It's, it's interesting because, you know, I talk to a lot of agents who have a similar uh, mindset about, well, nobody's going to do this as well as I do. And, mm -hmm. and they get to, as it sounds like you did, to this point of extreme burnout because they don't trust mm -hmm. anybody else to do that job. Mm -hmm. And I think you hit the nail on the head when you said it's, it's a limiting mindset, but fundamentally it is about mindset, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I think about as I hire people into this company or onto my team is my mindset is to, quote, fire myself from my job, 
right? Like that's how I think about it, right? Is yeah. I have to do all of these things and it's a, it's just so different and it and it changes the way that you think about who you're going to hire, mm-hmm. right? It sort of raises that bar, I think, implicitly when you go through the process that way. And it's really the it's really the key. Now, look, I still know to this day, as I'm sure you do, some agents who are a one man or woman band, right? Who do mm-hmm. quite well, and mm-hmm. they're okay with that. Like they're mm-hmm. somehow able to not burn out. I don't know how they do it, but as you talk to agents, so let's role play just a little bit here. So let's just okay. say I'm one of those agents, okay? So I'm here and I'm just working 24 by seven, and I and you come to me and you're like, hey, we should talk, we should work together, whatever, and I'm like, eh whatever. I got this, right? I work 24 yeah. seven. No one can do it better than I do. Mm-hmm. Change my mind. So the first question that I would ask is, you know, how much time are you spending prospecting? Mm-hmm. And the answer that I normally get is, you know, I'm spending say two to three hours a day prospecting or an hour mm-hmm. a day or whatever that is. Okay, great. What are your goals? Well, my goal is to double my business. Do you have the capacity then as a single agent Mm -hmm. to prospect for double the amount of time that you're prospecting and to be able to service twice as many clients as you currently have? Right. And the answer is no. It's always no. It's It's always no. Yeah. Yeah. And and so we're not taking things like like our company and what we do now, we're not taking that off of their plate. What we're doing is we're teaching automation, efficiency operations, things like that, that are going to essentially take away the prospecting time, right? So we're teaching these agents how to create inbound business, attract, attracting those ideal client profiles instead of having to chase. So it's buying back that prospecting time and at the same time, creating unlimited scalability in terms of how much business can come in. Right. So, so where does that begin for you, right? So if, if we were, so you've changed my mind, right? Like we're totally going to work together now on this. Where do you begin? Um, you know, how do you think about lead automation? What are some best mm-hmm. practices? You know, what is your message to our agentpreneurs out there? So the first thing that I would say, and I think this is super cliche, but it is more and more true every day. If you try to speak to everyone, you speak to no one. Yes. So first of all, the first thing we need to do is figure out who are you talking to? Who do you want to attract? What's that demographic that you want to speak to and that you want to build your business on? Now, I don't teach geo geo farming. I don't teach location, location niching. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is, you know, back in the day before the Internet, that was the only choice that we had. If you were going to be consistent and frequent in front of the same people and build any kind of brand awareness, that was the only way to do it. Because whether you were cold calling, door knocking, flyering, that was the only way to be able to actually do this in a consistent and frequent way. Now, with the invention or like the the commonality now of the internet, what we're actually able to do is niche down in terms of human being, in terms of demographic, in terms of pain point or life tra- are able to actually create better messaging. It's not, you know, when, when, you, when you farm an area, in that area, you may have one common demographic, but you're still going to have a mixture of first-time buyers and upsizers and downsizers or, and investors and hard to create a, a really relevant message. So when we niche down in terms of that life transition, we're able to hit those pain points, the pains, problems, fears, and desires so accurately that people will just sort of say, oh my gosh, this person understands me. And in my opinion, what marketing really is, is the ability to articulate the thing that is in the back of your ideal client's mind better than they can. Right. Mm-hmm. If you can articulate that better than they can, then they automatically will credit you with the solution. That's what good marketing is. It's really interesting. So just, you know, there's a, there's a quote in the in the article that we link below. It says market to the small pond, find a niche mm-hmm. and decide who your client will be. That's what we're talking about here, right? Exactly. Exactly. How do you guide somebody through the process of figuring out 
what that niche is. Is it is it just purely an underserved niche? Is it a niche that somehow aligns or overlaps with some unique attributes of the agent? Right? How do you identify that niche? So the first thing that we would want to look at is the demographic or like the primary demographics of the area. And I don't think underserved is usually a case nowadays mm -hmm. because there's very few agents that are properly niche down. Right. Right. Most agents are, you know, I can help you buy, sell, invest and lease from here to Timbuktu. Mm -hmm. I'll take right. I'll take anything, anything. that I can. I'll, yeah. I'll just I'll take anything. Right. Yeah. Um, so I don't think that there's an underserved issue in most markets. So the first thing that we want to look at is what is the primary transition that's happening in the market right now? Is it a mostly younger market that's upsizing? Is there a huge downsizing market happening? We want to look at that because obviously you want to be able to capitalize off of basically like what, what business is actually happening right now. Mm -hmm. The second thing that we want to look at is the agent themselves. Right. If you are a 21 year old agent just getting into the business and you decide that you want to work with downsizers, that's going to be a hard sell. Right. 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 <laughs> Those people are not necessarily going to resonate with you, especially when we come to like the nurture campaigns and the social media stuff and, you know, your life. The, uh, like showing your life online, creating that authentic connection, it's going to be very difficult for someone who, say, is 70 years old to resonate with your 21 year old lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So we also want to take a look at that and make sure that, you know, the, the you, you have either experienced or are experiencing the transition that they are going through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a connection like there's a connection that needs to be there. And I mean, real estate at the end of the day is just a human to human business. Right. 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 People um, either feel it or they don't. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So just let's dive into this a little bit deeper because I want to make mm -hmm. sure that everybody understands sort of there's a nuance here that I see and I'm curious to get your take on it. So when you talk about finding a niche marketing to a small pond, I can see sort of two different facets of that angle. One mm -hmm. being identifying a, a trend or an opportunity um, that's market driven. For example, let's say I've spoken to agents who specialize in people relocating to their particular niche of the country. This is happening mm -hmm. a lot right now, right? People are leaving the big cities. And so let's mm -hmm. say you're in one of these tier two, tier three cities that's attracting people, then you could build a niche to market to people who are looking to move to Boise, Idaho, for example, mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. That's one side, sort of market driven. The other, the other aspect is I, I spoke to an agent, um, you know, months ago now, and he's a former professional surfer, right? So yeah. that was his shtick. That was his thing, right? And so the niche that he found was really focusing his marketing efforts on, you know, beach communities. You know, his his little giveaway is, um, you know, wax for your surfboard, right? Everything that he did was in the realm of surfing because that was the niche that he was going after from a demographic, mm -hmm. you know, air quotes perspective. Mm -hmm. So how mm -hmm. do you think about those two? Are they equal in terms of the niche that you find? Are they the same thing? Are they different? I would actually add a third onto that. So okay. y yes, there's there's those niches in terms of like location, like relocation. Then we also have the like community type, waterfront beachfront, townhomes, condos, things mm -hmm. like that. But then we also have the like upsizers, downsizers, first time buyers, um, investors, the LGBT community. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're in, in a place like New York City, there's going to be, you know, young professionals, things like that, where you're actually targeting, okay, where are you in your life and where are you going? So mm -hmm. it's kind of like the, 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 that basic sales mentality of paint the vision. Right. Right. Most people don't realize that, especially especially in real estate, because we're so used to the transaction that we forget that this is actually a, a life transition. People don't move because it's fun. Moving's awful. Yeah, really <laughs> the is. reason why it really is. Right. And the reason why people move is because there's something in their current situation that is not serving them. And they're hoping that it can be fixed remedies, rectified with a move. Mm -hmm. And so it's basically current situation versus desired situation. Mm -hmm. And so it's really like when it comes down to it, like that is, that's the messaging. That's, you know, understanding where this person is, what's the pain point, and then what can be solved? What's the desired outcome 
for this move. I think way too many people are, I call it selling the airplane, Mm. you know, like when you're going on vacation, you don't want to hear that you're going to be put in a tin can with wings on it and hurled through the sky and served bad food. You want, you want the beach, you Mm. want the, you want the beach and the cocktails and the things like that. And travel doesn't sell the airplane. They sell the destination. It's the same thing in real estate. That's a really interesting point. I've never actually heard anybody describe it quite like that. So I I like that analogy, right? And I I think I see this even outside of real estate a lot, right? With, let's say, salespeople, you know, that's applicable here. Mm -hmm. And they're not selling the destination in this example or the solution. They're selling the nuts and bolts and the tactics and the airplane, right, as you said it. And I think that's a really interesting thing. Do you think that a lot of agents make that mistake in your experience? I think almost all of them do. I think that uh, a lot of the a lot of the marketing out there is very much focused on the agent. I'm number one. It's a good time to buy. Here are the market stats. Even kind of some of that old school, I'll buy your house stuff. It's it's really you know it's very logic based, but so it's the, the missing piece is really that marketing is psychological. Yeah, marketing is just psychology. It's the science of influence, and it's that emotional human. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's that emotional human side of things that makes the decision first. Right. And I think the agents that touch on that and the agents that understand it and know, you know, I think I think it's 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 powerful, but it also has to be used carefully because when you do understand people that well, there is the ability actually to manipulate quite easily. Right. And so there also needs to be that element of human connection. Mm-hmm. Not only do I fully understand you and I understand your pain points and I, I, I understand where you're going, I also am a, a decent human being who has a dog named Stanley and, you know, they, <laughs> yes. they, they, want, they want to feel the human element of it. Otherwise, it starts to feel very manipulative. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I'm, I'm still stuck on this. Don't sell the airplane, sell the destination because I think it's such yeah. a great analogy for this. And, you know, in thinking through... In, in my experience, having spoken to hundreds of agents, home buyers, whatever, right, mm-hmm. is ostensibly this is like the greatest moment, right? You're like, I'm going to buy a house and it should be yeah. so exciting. And it breaks down almost instantly because you're trying to find a house, especially in this market down here where things yeah. are just flying, right? And there's yeah. no inventory. But even in a normal time, you're like, is this the right house? Like, is it okay? The way I think about it, is it okay to say yes to this house? There's all of these analogies mm-hmm. to sort of like dating, right? It's like, I'm going to, I'm about to, I'm going to pick a house to marry here, right? You yeah. know, what happens if I say yes to this one and then one with, you know, that's a better deal or nicer comes on the market a week later. Like just, yep. It gets really, really challenging, but I think you're right. If you can get people focused on the destination, that helps. I'm curious to get your take on one thing. There's another, there's another um, sort of framework. It's called story brand. Mm-hmm. And there's a book, I don't know if you're, yeah, you're familiar with yep. what it sounds like. Yep. So for those of you who aren't, it, it basically, the, the, essentially the premise is this, that the arc of a good brand kind of follows the arc of pick your favorite movie, right? Mm-hmm. You have this idea that you have this imperfect hero, that is the buyer in this example, okay? Mm-hmm. Who meets a guide, that guide is you, the agent. You're the guide. You're not the hero. I really believe deeply in this. You are not the hero. Your buyer in this example is, or your seller is the hero, right? So the guy, the buyer meets the guide, right? He's the agent who helps transform them, right? And it's this idea of this imperfect hero becoming this sort of perfect hero, finding their superpower, or buying their home, or selling their home. And that Mm -hmm transformation is something that I think is really interesting in a powerful way, I think, to think about uh, everyone's role as a real estate agent. I think it's really interesting that you brought that framework into this conversation because it's actually something we teach. So the hero's journey is actually something we teach within the within the branding. And so when we're when we're talking about marketing or we're talking about especially content marketing and nurturing we break everything down into three major buckets there's your authority content there's your social proof content but then the third piece is your personal content and the way that we create that personal content and we create connection within that personal story is in two different ways it's breaking down the hero's journey in terms of the agent story but then also breaking down the hero's journey in terms of the client story yeah. Right. So a lot of that can be done. And it, it, like, there's two different levels to it. 
And it works so beautifully because everybody at the end of the day wants to be triumphant. Yep. They want to be the victor. And so what you can do in so many different ways, using both story, but also using case studies. Case studies are the most underutilized thing in the real estate That's marketing really space. That's really true. It's so true. It's used everywhere else, but it's not used here. Yeah. That's a really good point. Yeah. Ex explain to everybody what you mean by a case study. Yeah. Okay. So, so when we're talking about social proof, we break it down into three pieces. There's case studies, testimonials, and PR or media. And so when we're talking about the diff, a lot of people in real estate will use testimonials, screenshots of testimonials, mm -hmm. reviews, things like that. Now, we live in a time, unfortunately, where reviews and testimonials and things like that can be faked. Mm -hmm. And so people don't really trust reviews as much as they used to. So the alternative to that and the, and the, the way that we actually create even more deeper trust is through what I call a case study. So what a case study is, is it's actually the story of a successful client. And you're putting in instead of saying, look at me, look at me, you're saying, hey, look at Joe and Sally. Mm -hmm. They you know this is the situation that they were in before we started working together. They were, you know, wanting to sell their first home. They were having their first baby. Space was a really big issue. Mm -hmm. They were starting to fight because there, you know, there was toys all over the floor and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then from there, you start talking about the transition and you position yourself as that guide or as that person who is like taking them through this journey you know you talk about how they found you how you met basically what you're doing is you're allowing someone else to see themselves in sally and joe's shoes that's right 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 and so with that storytelling you're 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 it's kind of like a, a story a connection piece and a testimonial in one I love that. It's you're right. I can't even think of a single case study that I've seen from an agent in real estate. And mm -hmm. it is standard operating procedure in so many other industries because yeah. that is how you see yourself through someone else's story. And mm -hmm. frankly, I, I'll tell you what, I mean, as I think about social and, and quote unquote social proof, right? I think that most agents think that social proof only comes when you have tens of thousands of whatevers, right? Mm, or the just listed, just sold. <laughs> yeah, right, right. And it's yeah. not it's not actually the case. You know, I interviewed um, someone who was sharing another anecdote, right? But they got their first lead on YouTube, for example, with mm -hmm. hundreds of views, right? And that's not to say yeah. that it's a guarantee. It's not to say it's going to happen for everybody. But the point is that the bar actually for social proof, I personally don't think is that high. Right. I think somebody sees it's that not. you have a credible presence, that you're active on it. They read a case study, let's say this person knows what they're doing, because here's why I believe it. And you can tell me if you feel otherwise, mm -hmm. because very likely the way that they got to you has already talk about psychology, predisposed them to look for what in psychology they call confirming information, right? Or confirmatory mm -hmm. information as opposed to disconfirming or disconfirmatory information, right? Which is their mind is already preconditioned to say, I think I want to hire this person. And so you look for things that confirm your beliefs rather than uh, oppose your beliefs. Mm -hmm. And so I agree. does that make sense? Yep, totally. And I think that, that that's a really good point because people are people on social media. Well, not everybody, but for the most part, people on social media are actually out there. It doesn't matter what platform they're looking for people that they like. They're looking for people that they connect with mm -hmm. unless that person is like, you know, an Internet troll, which mm -hmm. you don't want to work with anyway. No. <laughs> right. And so so for the most part, people are out there looking for looking for connection. And, and that's, I mean, really what social media is at its core, it's a social network. Mm -hmm. It's not a marketing platform. It's a place for people to go and connect with other humans. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the mistakes that so many agents make is they try to create a billboard. Their, yeah. their social media is just listed, just sold. Here's a picture of my happy clients with a sold sign in front of this yeah. house. And hey, that's not, cheers. yeah, that's, that's not what social media is. And that's not what people are looking for on it, yeah. which is why, I mean, I have so many agents who come into our programs and they're like, I've never gotten anything from social media, but I'm active. And I look at it and I'm like, you're not really active. You're that's just right. kind of spamming people and selling people. And the only people who are going to engage with that kind of content is friends and family because yeah. they're trying to support your business. That's right. That's right. And then right? you conflate that with some level of success. Yes. 
Yeah, exactly. And and I think that there's this misconception that you have to also have a million followers in order to actually get business from social media. We have people in the program who have tripled, quadrupled, gotten to seven figures with a thousand followers. It's it's not about the numbers. Yeah. It's about the quality of those followers and the quality of the content when the followers will follow. It's like, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Please. No, yeah, like it's just I think that so many people think of think it's the other way and they'll go out and they'll try to buy followers and they'll try to, you know, they'll try to have those vanity metrics come first. But the truth really is, is you can have so much success on social media if your content's really dialed in, if you understand the messaging really well. And, you know, it, it's basically the difference. And I talk about this a lot, the difference between an entrepreneur and an influencer. Mm. If you're an entrepreneur then your your goal is actually money or deals or you know that before it is followers and things like that whereas an influencer is looking for audience before and money is the byproduct right it's, it's so true it's so true and i've talked about this a lot on this show um i started this show on facebook i started doing facebook mm. lives right started on yeah. facebook and we got a ton more views, right, on Facebook than we do on YouTube. But I switched to YouTube because the engagement time, it, it doesn't even compare, right? You know, yeah. Facebook engagement for us, right? This is just our own personal experience with video mm -hmm. was like these 10, 20 second views, right? And yeah. on YouTube, we're getting 12, 13, 14, 15 minutes of average engagement time. Yep. That's yep. meaningful. That's what I want. I want to talk to people who want to hear these messages. I don't want the vanity metrics. I'm going to have For to... For sure. And I... Never done I this before. Too... I've, I've got light coming in on me like crazy. There we go. <laughs> Please, I think the other thing that's so, that's so important is um, it's about the right message mm -hmm. to the right person at the right time, but also on the right platform. Yes. Right. And so a lot of the time, you know, people will choose whatever platform they like instead of it's not about you. Mm -hmm. None of this is really at the end of the day about you. It's about the audience. That's right. And so you have to meet the audience where they're at. If your audience is far more engaged on YouTube, then you need to be on YouTube. Whether or not you love YouTube or you prefer Instagram or whatever, you have to meet the audience where they're at. And I think yeah. that that's so, so important. Totally agree. Totally agree. Um, gosh, that was great. I can't believe like 30 minutes has already gone by, Jess. It, this already, <laughs> this always seems to happen. We just get on a roll here and I love it. Is there anything, Jess, that I missed that you want to talk about before we wrap up for today? Um, I think the only thing we didn't touch on that I that you mentioned early on is mm -hmm. just that idea of nurturing. And yeah. I just wanted to kind of talk about the, you know, the fact that is just a phone number and an email address if you yeah. don't actually nurture those people. And nurturing those people is not picking up the phone once a month or sending them an email drip campaign every couple of weeks or a market report. I think it's really important. That, and again, this is why the psychology comes in again. There are what, what we teach is basically a nine point psychological journey that automatically takes someone from stranger to client. Now, this nurture sequence can happen in a lot of different ways. We teach it through retargeting because it's the easiest way to actually force the content into people's feeds. But I think it's so important that people understand that there's more than just showing people you have business to get more business. I think that it's so important that people and, and I and I mentioned those three different buckets of content, the authority, the social proof and the personal. That's just a very simplified version of the nine types of content that I think people need in order to get from stranger to client and raise their hand and say, hey, you know what? I've seen your stuff. I'm ready to work with you. So many of our of our members will say, I had no idea this was possible. I'm getting messages from people saying, are you taking on clients right now? Yeah. Instead of feeling like they have to constantly chase. And the reason why I've developed the system the way that I have is it's mo it's also about quality of life. And there is a certain kind of lifestyle that you can have if business is incoming and you have a bit of like an automated machine built out in the back end, but that feels very personal and feels very authentic and feels very organic to the people who are in the like quote unquote in the funnel 
Interesting. Interesting. I think that's that's really helpful. Um, so if somebody wanted to learn more about how this works or, you know, the listings lab method, um, how do they do that? Mm -hmm. Facebook is probably the best place, right? Facebook is probably the best place. Um, if you join my Facebook group, the first thing that I'm going to ask you to do is download the listings lab guide, mm -hmm. which actually breaks down our entire methodology from a psychological standpoint. So I think that that was important. Yes. Um, so yeah, the listings lab method for real estate agents is the Facebook group and either there or Instagram. Awesome. And I, and I have that up on the screen right now just to remind everybody. And again, the link is below. Cool. So definitely come here and check this out. This is a great place to start. Um, so that's awesome. awesome. Gosh, um, just thank you so much for joining today and for sharing all these insights. I love your story. I love your journey. I think we're aligned a lot on our perspective around you know, what agents should be yeah. doing, which is a happy yeah. coincidence. Doesn't always have to be the case, but it's I not like always the case, but yeah, I, I agree. Exactly. Uh, fantastic. Well, Jess, I hope we get an opportunity to have you back on the show one day. This was a lot of fun and I would, I would be I would love to. Uh, honored to do it again. I would love to. Thank you. Awesome. All right, Jess, we'll see you soon. See you soon. Bye. Bye. Okay. Well, there you have it. Um, I think a tremendous show and a lot of alignment. And I think what you're hearing are a lot of things that I talk about a lot and, you know, other guests that I have on, which is, you know, there's, so many things that so many people are doing wrong. And I don't mean that to be <laughs> harsh. It's just the honest truth. There's so many things that are doing wrong. I love this idea of don't sell the airplane, sell the destination. I think we'll mm -hmm. actually title the episode that. I think that's fantastic. So cool. that's it for today. Until tomorrow, be safe, be healthy, be happy, and we'll see you soon.